Okay, so results. A results section is often also one where you can kind of, I wouldn't say skip over it, but uh, unless you're really into statistics, uh, you can kind of skim over it because results are basically where they're just laying out the statistical results. So, you know, they're laying out the mean sincerity deviations of each group, especially in this study, they're going to get into correlational values like R coefficients. Uh, if there are experiments going on and group differences, you know, differences between the control and experimental group, they'll get into the t-test or f-test if they're running multiple independent variables. And of course, the significance of the values, the p-values. So obviously, if the p is at 0.05 or below, uh, then you're going to be having significant findings. If it's above 0.05, then they're not significant findings. But this doesn't really talk about uh, the meaning of the findings, that's going to be found in the discussion section. Usually they're just outlying one statistic after another. So, you know, we ran this correlation, this is what this correlation was. So we ran this significance test, this was the result of that significance test. Uh, so again, it, unless you're into statistics, um, this section usually isn't the most interesting or enlightening section to read. So the discussion section, right along with the intro, are probably the two most important sections to really get into, and to not just skim, but to really read. Because the results section is, is going to discuss uh, whether or not the hypotheses were confirmed. So basically what the results mean in plain language without all the statistics getting in the way. And very importantly, they're gonna discuss all the limitations of the study, or at least hopefully the main limitations of the study. So for example, this study didn't have a very good sample. So they were just psychology undergrads. Uh, could we take the results from the sample and extrapolate them to or, or apply them to a more general sample of maybe older adults or even younger children? Probably not, because uh, I think the oldest people in the sample were 22 and the youngest were 17. And then, of course, the limitations of the methods as we got into this wasn't, uh, these Facebook profiles weren't observed by everyday people, but rather by people with uh, some pretty good psychological training. So, Obviously, if someone without that training were to look at these Facebook profiles, they probably wouldn't even be as accurate in gauging their personality. Uh, so what can be done in the future? So obviously they should discuss ways of overcoming limitations, so maybe getting a better sample, maybe having other people, non-psychology undergraduates, be observers, uh, testing maybe that's the same hypothesis in different ways. Uh, so one way in which I was kind of disappointed that they didn't choose to test this is in order to really see if people are putting their idealized self forward, you need to measure their idealized self. This would be very easy to do. So in other words, give someone the same TIPI, the same personality inventory, and instead of asking, okay, what, you know, accurately describe yourself on this inventory, say, uh, put down values for this inventory for how you would like to be. So instead of saying like how extroverted you actually are, say, okay, imagine your idealized self, imagine the person you would most want to be, how would that person answer this extroversion subscale or this neuroticism subscale? And then run a correlation between people's observer ratings and that rating. Uh, that would be a much more direct test to see if people's idealized selves are correlated with the way observers are seeing them. So for example, you know, with the neuroticism, uh, maybe people were viewing uh, uh, really idealize selves when it comes to neuroticism. Usually people don't like to think of themselves as being neurotic and it's clear that the correlation between people's actual neuroticism scales uh, and observers view of their neuroticism didn't correlate so maybe in that case it correlated stronger with their idealized selves uh, neuroticism um, uh, trait. So it would have been good to take measures not only of their actual personality but of their ideal personality what they wish they could be and seeing which correlation or which correlated stronger with observer ratings. That would have been a, a much better direct test of those two theories. So then of course that uh, you could test additional hypotheses that that you know method which we just discussed would be a good way in fact of doing that of testing more directly the idealized self hypothesis. And then also maybe revising and scrapping whole theories. So in fact if they had found if maybe they'd done the test and found uh, that people uh, observer ratings more strongly correlated with idealized self ratings, maybe then they would have to really reconsider their own hypothesis that people put up an accurate portrayal of themselves on these Facebook sites. Uh, another key thing here, and just the way it's written, is that usually while the intro section goes from general to specific, the discussion section kind of goes backwards from the specific findings back to general, you know, how can these findings reflect the ways in which we work, uh, you know, the ways in which we um, maybe treat each other psychologically, uh, the ways in which we maybe treat mental disabilities, 
but they're going to apply this specific finding back to the real world in some uh, meaningful way. So uh, that sort of uh, applies to the paper in general is that the paper tends to go from, okay, here's this big real world topic. Here's a specific way in which we're investigating these topics. So now we're going to talk specifically about the methods and the results and the discussion takes that specific finding and then applies it again more broadly to the real world. So then, of course, it's going to wrap up with references, which is usually only important to the reader if you're looking at specific articles that interested you. So if you remember way back to the intro section, there was an article detailing sort of the idealized self hypothesis that people put up their idealized self on uh, uh, online social networking sites. Well, if you're really interested in this topic, you might want to look at that because that presents a differing viewpoint from this article, and maybe they found results that back up that viewpoint. So if you were going to do an article or a research topic on this, you'd really want to go back, look at the references, and figure out, okay, where can I find this article and learn more about this topic? Also, if you want to check, res or, uh, check people sources, so are people uh, in this article accurately representing past research? Uh, again, this is something that's checked out by the people who publish the article. So just a good tip that you want to always look at reputable journals that have a lot of peer review and a lot of uh, high criterion before publishing articles. So they sort of check all this stuff so that you don't necessarily have to. But if you're really getting into a research topic, so for example, if you're doing a dissertation, you're definitely expected to look at all of the articles uh, that you cite or that are cited by the articles you're interested in. So, you know, oftentimes you will if you're really getting into a research topic, look at all the articles cited in the topic of, of interest so that you can double check and make sure that they're accurately represented. And then some uh, articles are even going to include appendix where they'll display measures, materials used, uh, and sometimes uh, any tables, diagrams, footnotes, extra reports, on and on and on that might be of interest to the reader. Usually this is just included for people who might want to replicate the study or if they're using some material that is relatively new. So for this study, there was no appendix because they just used the TIPI, which is a very uh, well-validated and oftentimes used personality inventory. So they kind of assume that you can find that somewhere else. Um, the table that uh, I looked at or that I showed was, in, in fact, included in the appendix. So, uh, you know, oftentimes that is where they'll include tables, um, you know, charts, graphs, that sort of thing, which may be of interest to, to readers. So uh, I did want to include a reference example just as a way to, you know, look up things that are cited. So, for example, this one where it talks about uh, how OSN profiles are sometimes used to create and communicate idealized selves. Well, then it lists an article here, Monago, Graham, Greenfield, and Sal Salinkin, Salinkin uh, done in 2008. So if you're interested in that article, you'd go to the references. And, of course, they're in alphabetical order listed by the first author. And this is when they'll get into the actual reference. So they list the not only the last names of each author, but their initials here. So Monago AM. Uh, and then the year it's published, 2008. This is followed by the title of the article, Self-Presentation and Gender on MySpace. The journal in which it was published is going to be a italicized here, Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology. Uh, the issue number, 29, is also going to be italicized. And then they'll give the specific page numbers where you can find it. So this article was from page 446 to 458, so about 12-page article there listed in that journal. So this is what you can use to go ahead and, and look up that article if you wanted to read it. And probably the easiest way to do that would just be to take the title and then put it into a search database like PsycInfo, which we'll talk about here in a bit, and that'll it'll probably come up. But if you have a bunch of journals and you know, oh, I have this issue of Journal of Applied Developmental Psychology, well, there you can look right into that in issue 29, page 446 to find that article.